Welcome, my friends, on this special day of Shavuot slash Pentecost, depending on what tradition you come from, to the launch of Hebrew Gospel Pearls, uncovering the pearls of language, history, and context of the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. You are listening to Hebrew Gospel Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring Hebrew New Testament manuscripts for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I am here with my friend and Hebrew scholar, Nehemia Gordon. Nehemia, I've been waiting 18 years for this. Tell me it's really happening. Is it really happening? Well, at least we're going to do the first episode. And uh, if God graces us with more life, hopefully we'll continue to do more. This first episode we're actually going to do, we're just going to jump into it and do Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, which is the first section in Hebrew Matthew. I hate to interrupt you. I know you're Nehemiah Gordon from the Hebrew University. There's no 17 in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. It's a red alert. No no verse 17. Okay, so it's Matthew 1 verses 1 through 16 in the Hebrew Matthew. Verse 17 is actually omitted, but we'll talk about verse 17 as it appears in the Greek. And I think that's a great opportunity to explain to people, this is not, at least from my perspective, what I don't envision us doing is only looking at the Hebrew and ignoring the Greek. On the contrary, the Greek is the basic text, and we'll be looking at the Hebrew and comparing it. And really, as I've prepared this section, Keith, I think a lot of the things we'll be discussing are bigger issues that don't even have anything to do. I mean, even if we didn't have the Hebrew, these would be issues that are worth discussing and worthy of study. Just to understand the Gospel of Matthew from a Hebrew perspective, even if we didn't have the Hebrew Matthew, and even now more so with the Hebrew Matthew, does it shed some more light on it? You know, it's interesting, Nehemiah. I was, uh, you know, as we did, we did some preparation for this, and it has really, really been exciting. And we've been talking about the different things that we were going to bring to bear on this study. Could you just give the folks just a few of the sources we're going to use as we prepare to jump into this? Wow. So what I, what I envisioned doing is I would take the 28 manuscripts of Hebrew Matthew that I have on my computer, images of them, and I would compare word by word each, essentially each verse. And of course, we don't have 28 for any individual verse. Like for example, chapter one, I don't remember the exact number. I have it here somewhere. But it's something like, I think there's maybe uh, 15 manuscripts or something. I can actually look it up here. And so I thought that's really all that would be involved. And as I studied this, we came upon some incredible sources. And uh, I want to share, I want to maybe hold some of those in reserve and and share later. Before you do that, I just want to say one thing, because you sometimes you'll quickly pass over this. And I want people to understand this because there is some confusion. The 28 manuscripts that you have found, and there are some people that have heard this story, but I want people to understand a little bit about what that process was, Nehemia, because Mm -hmm. it really is the reason that this really, when you went, yep, we should do it, it was because we were dealing with the manuscripts, not just Howard's manuscript, which was based on nine manuscripts that he had, but can you give us just a little bit about what that process was? So Howard had the nine manuscripts that he lists in his book, and what I did is I went to the National Library of Israel, to the Institute of, at the time it wasn't the National Library, it was the Jewish National and University Library, And I looked through the catalog of the Institute of Microfilmed Hebrew Manuscripts, which has or or attempts to have a catalog of, or actually photographs of every Hebrew manuscript in the world. And I say attempts to have, because over the last year, I've learned that that's not entirely true. They have a large percentage of the Hebrew manuscripts in the world photographed. And once they had the photographs, then they would catalog them and say, okay, we have microfilm number 51023, what's in there? And they would write down what was in there. And sometimes they're cataloged in detail because one of the things that would happen in Hebrew manuscripts is you would have somebody who would order a manuscript from a scribe and he'd say, you know, I'm a doctor and so I want something in this manuscript about medicine, but I also, in my spare time, I want to study Maimonides, but I'm also interested in in astronomy. So you'd have a manuscript that was a collection of like five different things Mm -hmm. copied from five different sources. Mm -hmm. And what they did in, in, in the Institute of Microfilm Hebrew Manuscripts is they went through every one of the manuscripts they had photographs for, even some they didn't have photographs for, where they actually went to the library and cataloged it by hand without even ha- bringing photographs back, and they made this database. And so I opened up the database and asked the simple question first, what are the nine manuscripts that Howard uh, had? I want to see them with my own two eyes, at least the photographs with my own two eyes. That's important. Then I said, what other manuscripts are there? Right, Howard mentions in the introduction to his book from 1987, the Gospel of Matthew according to a primitive Hebrew text, he says, this is just the foundation. You know, he explains something that was really important, which is that, why did Howard do this in the first place? 
he kind of stumbled upon Hebrew Matthew. Up until Howard, everybody who had discussed Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew had understood it to be the same version that was published in the 1500s by these two priests. One was a Protestant priest named Munster, and the other was a Catholic priest named Dutelet. And each one of them found, or, or said they found, a Hebrew manuscript among the writings of the Jews with Matthew in it, and then they published it. And everyone assumed that Munster and Dutelet's Matthew was the same as Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And Howard, out of curiosity, ordered a copy from the British Library, and he immediately saw this is completely different. Not completely, 100% different, but it's um, from the time of Shem Tov through Dutelet, it's gone through this incredible revision where it looks much more like the Greek text in Dutelet and Munster, but in the Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, which is what we'll be discussing primarily, it preserves things that you don't find in the Greek sometimes. It'll have, like, verse 17, the whole verse is omitted. Right. So, so I read something that he said, just one little sure. thing he said in it. This isn't related to what you're about to talk about. He says, when I examined Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew more carefully, I was astounded to discover that its core was an original Hebrew composition, not a translation. Moreover, the kind of Hebrew in which it was written is just what one would expect of a document composed in the first century A.D., and preserved by Jews during the Middle Ages. That's a pretty big statement. <laughs> it's an extremely bold statement. Yes. And he's been heavily criticized for it. Mm -hmm. But it's very important what he says. If you read his article, and, and we, you know, we called upon the people to read the article in preparation for this, he wrote an article in 1986. Well, I want to read some excerpts. He says, It is now possible to recover much of the original Hebrew composition from an extant manuscript. Mm -hmm. That's profoundly different from saying, I have the original written by Matthew in the first century. Mm -hmm. And he gives the analogy. He talks about Ben Sirah or the wisdom of, of Syrac, which is part of the, the Apocrypha. So we have uh, the full Greek text that was preserved by the, by the Christian church mm -hmm. as part of the Septuagint. We have manuscripts from the third century or around the year 300. And in the wisdom of Syrac or Ben Sirah, it says in the introduction it was translated from Hebrew by the grandson of the author, and he's writing that around 175 BC, meaning the book itself was written around 200 BC. But we don't have the Hebrew original, or we didn't have the Hebrew original until, uh, and it was debated for centuries. Is it true that it was written in Hebrew, or is this just kind of something to give it more credibility? The author claims it was written in Hebrew in order to you know, give it more spice. People will look at that and say, oh, this is, this is a, a legitimate document because mm -hmm. it wasn't just written in Greek. It was written in Hebrew, translated into Greek. Or was it really written in Hebrew? This was a debate in scholarship for hundreds of years. And then in 1896, these two Scottish sisters, Lewis and Gibson, were traveling through uh, Cairo and they came upon the Ben Ezra synagogue. And in the Ben Ezra synagogue, they found these documents in a closet. And they asked the people there, can we have these? And they bought the documents from the Jews there and brought them back to Cambridge University to a professor there named Solomon Schechter. And Solomon Schechter immediately recognized one of the documents as the Hebrew text of Ben Sira. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, you think it would end here. We have the Hebrew text of Ben Sira. However, it was from the Cairo Geniza and dated to around the year 1000. And people said, wait a minute, we have Ben Sira from 300 AD in the Greek. What do we, you know, that Hebrew text from the year 1000, 700 years later, it's probably a translation from Greek. In other words, they're saying even if it was written in Hebrew, it was translated into Greek and then translated back into Hebrew. And this was hotly debated about whether it was even originally written in Hebrew, even after Solomon Schechter published the Hebrew text. And he had multiple manuscripts as well. And it wasn't until Yigal Yadin, the Israeli archaeologist from Hebrew University, uh, went to excavate at Masada. And at Masada, they uncovered fragments of the original Hebrew of Ben Sira. And this finally definitively proved that Ben Sira, the wisdom of Syrac, was originally written in Hebrew and from there translated into Greek. Mm -hmm. Now, what Howard points out, and is a very important point, is if you compare the fragments found by Yigal Yadin at, on Masada from, a, you know, from around the year zero, right? There's no year zero, right? But from, let's say 100 BC or 50 BC. So if you compare those to the one from the year 1000, it's gone through a major change, meaning as scribes copied the text, they would maybe put things into their own language, they would change the wording. Often it might not be on purpose, it would just be out of habit. There'd be a certain term there and they would replace it with a different term they're more familiar with. And so what happened is we have the full Greek text of Ben Sirah, which we know was translated from Hebrew around 175 BC. We have fragments, a verse here and a verse there, in Hebrew, 
from the Second Temple period found at Masada. And then we have a much fuller text, not the entire text, but most of the text and, and a number of manuscripts from the Cairo Geniza. Now, that doesn't mean that the Hebrew from the Cairo Geniza is exactly what Ben Sira wrote in 200 BC, because the text went through changes over time. And the point is that uh, Howard compared this to Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. He said, look, these rabbis preserved it. And as they preserved it, they would do things that rabbis would do. For example, if they saw God's name, yud heh vav -Heh, there's no way they would leave that in the Gospel of Matthew. They would replace that with Hashem. We know that's what the Jewish scribes would do. And so just as Ben Sira was written in Hebrew, translated into Greek, and we have a Hebrew uh, descendant of that text from the Cairo Geniza, he argued that this Hebrew Matthew text was, was analogous, that it, it wasn't word for word what Matthew wrote in the first century, but within it, you could recover the original, some of the original text. Now, here's the important part about this, and yes. I think you were uniquely crafted to be able to do this. Howard says that one of the difficulties with these manuscripts is they're very difficult to decipher. If you look at what's behind me, this is a page from the manuscript that Howard was looking at. And if you notice the first script that you say is, oh, that looks like, you know, that's something that we can read. But just under that, Nehemiah, it's a different script. Can you explain to people why so, that is? That's so with respect to Howard, it's difficult to decipher for someone who's been trained in, in biblical Hebrew, who only knows the square script. But, you know, yeah. you study the, the medieval cursive and semi-cursive and and uh, medial, and there's, there's many different Hebrew scripts. <laughs> Once you get to know those scripts, they're actually quite easy to read. Okay, uh, some, of them, some of them are not, to be fair, like the Sephardic cursive from like, I don't know, from a relatively early period is, there's three different forms of the Aleph on the same line, sometimes in the same two word span. So that's a little bit difficult, but this script is quite easy to read. But if you weren't trained in how to read this script, you you know, it would be difficult to you. Let me just say this. You were trained in the ability to do this. And what his point is, he says the people that are interested in it have a difficult deciphering it. The people Actually, that... Keith, I wasn't trained in this script. So I was trained in a way. I was prepared. I wasn't trained. You were prepared. So here's how I was prepared. My first year at Hebrew University, I probably only understood about 80% of what the professors were saying. And I realized if I didn't get someone's detailed notes of what was taught, I would fail my tests. <laughs> and there were these young ladies who were in my classes, and they wrote down everything the professor said. And I mean everything. This is before people were typing away on the computer. It was written by hand. And literally, the professor would sometimes say, okay, this is an administrative matter. Don't write this down. And they would write that down too. So I went to five different young ladies, and I said, can I have your notes? Can I photocopy your notes? And I photocopied them. Mm -hmm. And then I sat down to prepare for the tests, and I opened up the notes, and I realized I couldn't read them. But they were in Hebrew. Why couldn't I read them? Because I was taught in kindergarten, I was taught to write Hebrew, but I was taught to write Hebrew the way that diaspora Jews were taught in the 1970s to write Hebrew. The way they write Hebrew in Israel is different. Not only is it different, within Israel it's different. So I had five sets of notes, handwritten, and each set of notes used a different alphabet. It was Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. But the bet of one girl was different from the bet of the other girl, of the third girl, who was a Yemenite. She had a different bet. And I thought, I'm going to fail the test. What am I going to do? And I started to panic. And then I realized, okay, we had a class in um, Hebrew epigraphy where you took Paleo Hebrew and you just sat down and you deciphered it. So I sat down and I said, okay, I know that's the word et, because et appears every time there's a direct object, a determined direct object. So that's the Aleph and that's the Tav. Okay, we've got the et. I know that's a bet. That's a cough. And I literally, it took me probably an hour for each set of notes, and I deciphered what it said. I determined that's her final nun. That's her final tzai. But Nehemiah, you know, you said you, you weren't trained in it and you learned, but guess what? You were in effect. In a way. So I did the same thing with this text behind you. I sat down and I learned what the alphabet was. And this alphabet's frankly a lot easier than the notes I had in my undergrad because the Aleph looks a lot like an Aleph. And uh, the hay looks a lot like a cursive hay. I mean, it, it, this was easier. Here's the thing. I, I just want to establish one thing. Those 28 manuscripts that you scoured the library for, they're in this type of script, different types of script. It's not an easy thing to read. You have learned to read it. So when we're able to have you to discuss- Oh, they're in a dozen different scripts. They're not just in this script. They're in, I wouldn't say a dozen. They're in ne many different scripts because they're from different centuries, from different places. Like the one behind you is an Italian, I would call it a medial script. You know, those terms are, are hotly debated. 
Okay. Here's the point. Uh, uh, we're uh, about to launch into 1 through 17, 1 through yeah. 16 in Hebrew. And you have been able to look at 28, diff- potentially 15, depending on, like you said, depending on what we're reading. Yeah. I just want to establish the fact that that's the beauty of There's this. actually series. 16 manuscripts that preserve chapter 1, verses 1 through 16 of Hebrew Matthew. So I just want to tell folks, this is a gift. I want to thank you. Let's move into it. Thank you very much for explaining that. Okay. So, I mean, wow, there's so much to talk about here. Um, I want to read a couple more things from Howard's article. Yes. It's called The Gospel of Matthew Originally Written in Hebrew, or uh, was The Gospel of Matthew Originally Written in Hebrew in 1986. He says, I do not mean to suggest that the Hebrew in Shem Tov's text is pure first century AD Hebrew, for it clearly is not. And we'll see an example later, or very soon, I think, of that, where it has the Greek word or the Latin word Christos. I mean, obviously, that's not Hebrew first century. The first century text must be linguistically excavated, so to speak. Shem Tov's Matthew is written in biblical Hebrew with a healthy mixture of Mishnaic Hebrew and later rabbinic vocabulary and idiom. It also reflects changes by medieval Jewish scribes who, among other things, attempted to make it read more like the Greek. In other words, as the scribes copied it, they said, wait a minute, verse 17 is missing. And some scribes supplied verse 17, right? Meaning there's some Hebrew Matthew manuscripts that have verse 17 because they said that's missing. Well, according to Howard, it's missing because it wasn't originally in that version. Moreover, the primitive layer of Shem Tov's Matthew, Howard says, is written in an unpolished style and is filled with ungrammatical constructions and Aramaicized forms and idioms. Mm -hmm. Meaning Aramaic was a predominant language in the first century and even the Jews who spoke Hebrew, it was heavily colored by Aramaic. Mm -hmm. An analogy would be, Tejanos, that is, people of Spanish descent in Texas who speak Spanish, mm-hmm. it's heavily, they're, they're, I'm not an expert in Spanish, but I'm told their Spanish is not the Spanish they speak in Mexico. It's heavily colored by English because mm-hmm. they're surrounded by English speakers. In these characteristics, it resembles many of the Dead Sea Scroll fragments and gives the appearance of belonging to the same time frame. Reading Shemto's Matthew, Howard says, is often like reading one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can I bring one thing about this, just for the perspective, from the issue of perspective, that We have said for years, and we're saying it again, this is not the Hebrew gospel of Matthew that we believe that Matthew penned. This is a witness. Absolutely. Say witness. Let me say it again. A witness that we can use when we look at the English and the Greek and the Hebrew and all of these things together, we can come to what we call, it smells like there's a taste of the original Hebrew. There's some folks that get frustrated because they say, I can't find this word. It's not in the Tanakh. That's because that particular word, whether it was Mishnaic Hebrew or in fact, even maybe even uh, some Yiddish a little bit every once in a while. Yiddish. I'm not aware of any Yiddish. A couple of examples of things that just are not, they're not biblical Hebrew is the point. I, I don't think there's any Yiddish in Shemto's Hebrew. Aramaic. <laughs> Aramaic. I'm sorry, Aramaic. Uh, <laughs> Aramaic, and, there, and there's Latin words that we'll yeah, see, yeah, which yeah. are glo- obviously glosses. But, but these words, these words are not all exactly what was, but we have a witness. So this is why this is so exciting. And, and this is the first time we've had someone that's looking at all 28 manuscripts that you've been able to scour. I want to read something else Howard wrote, or, or I'll explain it. It's, it's a really important point. So he brings the analogy first to Ben Sira, right? And what that means is we know Ben Sira was written around 200 BC, or we believe now, right? That, that it was true that it was translated from Hebrew. But the one from the year 1000 isn't identical word for word. It's been transmitted. And over that period of transmission, sure, things changed. It's a witness to the original Hebrew that sometimes gets behind some of the problems in the Greek and gives us a better understanding than we'd have from the Greek alone. But you have no choice with studying Ben Sira. The Greek is still the primary text. There it There's is. There's whole sections where the where the Greek doesn't, uh, where, where the, there is no Hebrew text. There's only Greek. That's with Ben Sira. So another analogy that Howard, and this is really important because people will say, uh, uh, damn you, you're saying that the, the uh, Matthew is a translation from the Hebrew. Well, Yes and no, not exactly. So he brings the analogy of Josephus. Josephus was a Jew from the Galilee who was a general in the army of the Jewish rebels against the Romans. He was captured by the Romans and then remained a prisoner of the Romans for the rest of his life. And he wrote a book Mm -hmm. called The Jewish War. Mm -hmm. You could tell just from the name, he wrote it from the Roman perspective because from the Jewish perspective, it was the Roman War. Mm -hmm. So he wrote this book called The Jewish War. And in the introduction, he makes the statement that he has written this in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say when he says Hebrew, he means Aramaic. That seems rather unlikely to me. And then later, here, let me read it to you because it's that important. Mm -hmm. Because here we have, so it's Jewish war. It's the first section. He says, whereas the war which the Jews made with the Romans has been the greatest of all those, not only, so basically saying this is the biggest war of of, of his period. This wasn't some minor skirmish for the Romans. It It was a major war. Mm -hmm. 
and he says everybody else is lying about it. Verse three of war, chapter uh, one, sec verse three, I have proposed to myself for the sake of such as live under the government of the Romans to translate those books into the Greek tongue, which I formerly composed in the language of our country and sent to the upper barbarians. And by upper barbarians, he means the, the Jews living in, in uh, uh, the Parthian empire, mm -hmm. that is uh, Babylonia, what today is Iraq and Iran, essentially and then possibly what today is uh, uh, Yemen. Mm -hmm. I, Joseph, the son of Matthias, by birth a Hebrew, a priest also, and one who was first fought against the Romans myself and was forced to be present at what was done afterwards and the author of this work. So he's telling you, he first wrote it in Hebrew, or he says the language of our country, and then for those who don't know Hebrew, he translated it into Greek. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the Greek, I'm not a Greek expert to the degree where I can say this, but Greek experts say this, that the Greek sure has a flavor of Hebrew, but it also flows pretty well. It's, it's pretty good in Greek. And what I'm, what Howard argues and others have, have said is that it wasn't that he took it and translated it word for word. He essentially rewrote it in Greek. Mm -hmm. And they described this as a first recension, the Hebrew recension and the Greek recension. And Howard argued that Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew was simply the Hebrew recension of which the Greek recension was written by Matthew as well. Mm -hmm. Are you with me on that? that that's a 100%. key point. So we're not saying, oh, well, let's throw away the Greek. It's just a later Greek translation. We're not saying that at all. Jemia, yes. we can't throw away the Greek. They made me take hours and hours and what hours. What was your first part called? Hours. First one was suicide Greek. <laughs> then I had to take exegesis. And I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is hours of Greek. And what you did in throwing me the curveball, 18 years, say 18, 18. 18 years ago, when you said the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, I will tell you, I have confessed to the world. The first thing I thought is, he found the original Matthew. Are you kidding me? And over time, we yeah. learned, I learned that we have a witness. But I'll tell you something, this witness is filled with pearls. So I want to get into that. I mean, it's All right, let's jump right in. Yes. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do this because we've never done it before. No. But uh, why don't we start with, can I read a few verses just in the Hebrew? Oh, I would love it if you would do Matthew. And one of the things we did is, is we, we um, involved a, uh, a vowel expert who uh, put the vowels in. I could read it without vowels, but for anybody else who wants to read it, it probably would help them if they're not fluent in Hebrew. Ele toldot Yeshua ben David ben Avraham. These are the Toldot, the generations of Yeshua, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Stop. If that's as far as we go, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> Can I please? This is a very controversial verse in the Hebrew. This verse is huge. I want to tell everyone, um, when I first read this verse, I was a brand new person, brand new Christian when I was age 15, and they handed me a book, and they said, here's the book you're supposed to read. You may have heard the story before, but I started reading, and in English it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I can confess to you, I don't mind saying it, when I first learned the name Jesus Christ, I figured that was a first and a last name. So later I learned Joseph Christ and Mary Christ. I'm not trying to be funny. They put in here, uh, this is the genealogy, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. And from my perspective, I'm asking a question. Who is David? Who's Abraham? Now read the first verse again in Hebrew and you find a really major difference. So, Ela toldot Yeshua, these are the generations of Yeshua. Ben David, the son of Abraham, Ben Avraham, the son of Abraham. How do you, when you, when you read that first verse, what, what comes, jumps off the, there's no, there's no Christos there. There's no, in English, there's no uh, Mashiach in that. This must be an anti-Messiah uh, as they made charges against it. This is an anti-Messiah. Well, for, for, so for those who don't know, literally, uh, uh, I don't know how much of this we want to share. Well, I mean, it was a public event. We were speaking uh, and there was another speaker and he got up and he pointed at me with spittle, like coming out of his mouth and he says that man wants you to believe this hebrew matthew which is anti-messiah and his proof was that in verse one of chapter one it doesn't say mashiach it doesn't say yeshua hamashiach which in the greek is jesus christu yesu christu mm. yeshua messiah it just says yeshua and therefore it's anti-messiah and what happened for me as we were studying this, antichrist as we were studying this antichrist story, jew i asked the question for a new Christian who's reading this, why do I need the explanation? I need the explanation of who this is. This is in English, Jesus Christ. But when you as a Jew read the first sentence, isn't there something also that jumps off the page when you find out son of David? What does that make you think of? So the first thing you hear when you, you know, think of when you hear son of David, he's, are we looking, we're looking for the son of David. Amen. The son of David is another way of saying the Messiah. 
now, like when you say Ben David today, yeah. you know, it's the Messiah, right? So the Greek, the Greek has to help me. Especially since he's not David's literal son, right? Even by the genealogy, there's multiple generations, right? But I don't know who David and Abraham is. It's helped me by saying, listen, just in case you don't know about David and Abraham, his name is Jesus Christus, Jesus Christ. So immediately I'm supposed to know that. I've just prayed this prayer. This is now the Bible verse that's going to help me understand it. But for you, this is important for people to hear. When we and I talked about this verse, when you read, son of David, you don't, you're not confused. No, it's clear. So what you're saying is that adding Christ in there, or Mashiach, is an, could essentially be a gloss for the yeah. non-Jewish audience to say, yeah. oh, Ben David, that's, that's what we mean, you know, that's Christ. Yes, awesome. But in Hebrew, it obviously, it doesn't have that. That doesn't mean it, we're going to find later. So, so the claim was, when the man accused this of being anti-Messiah, was that nowhere in the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew, in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, was Yeshua called Messiah, so I did a systematic study. I want to share this with the people. I'll make this a PDF available on nehemiahswall.com. So I went through every time the word Mashiach appears in the Hebrew and Christ appears in the Greek. Can we go through some of these? It's a little bit tricky because Herod says, where will the Messiah be born? So does that refer to Yeshua? Well, Herod doesn't know it refers to Yeshua. He just is looking for somebody who's going to be king in his stead, right? Right, because right? Herod was a king of, of Israel, but he wasn't an anointed king. A Mashiach means anointed one. Mm -hmm. So he's worried, okay, there's a usurper who's going to take my crown, mm -hmm. and he's an anointed king. Who's that? He doesn't know it's Yeshua. He has no idea who it is. He doesn't even ask the name. He just wants to know where it's going to be. Mm -hmm. It doesn't occur to him that somebody would know the name. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, we have Yesu Christu, Jesus Christ, but in the Hebrew, it's just Yeshua. Does that mean that the Hebrew there is saying Yeshua is not the Messiah? And remember, guys, I'm the Karite Jew. I'm just studying this text, trying to understand what the text is saying, not what I'm saying, right? So in Matthew 1.16, it does call him Mashiach. C can we read that? That's in our section. So let's read that. So Matthew 1.16, Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, who is called Mashiach. And then the Hebrew adds, Uvelaaz, and in the foreign tongue, Christos. So this is a textbook gloss. What is a gloss? A gloss is... You know, they didn't have hyperlinks back in the old days. So if there was a word that people wouldn't understand, they would sometimes write it in the margin. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they must have written in the margin and in the foreign tongue, Christos. Why would they write that? Because the Jews who were copying this in the time of Shem Tov, the purpose was to debate the Catholics. They were forced into these debates called the Disputations. They were forced into these disputations against the Catholics to defend Judaism. And so in order to do that, they had to read what's in the New Testament. Mm. And so if you're debating with the, with the Catholic... Calling a Mashiach isn't going to help. you got to know what the Latin word is. And so here it says in the foreign tongue, Christos, that's a later gloss. So here in verse 16, all you had to do was read 16 verses later. So in verse 1, you're right, it doesn't call him Yeshua Mashiach. But all you had to do was read 16, 15 more verses and you would have found that he's, like, I mean, it's almost on the same page. I don't remember if in Howard's text well, it's, it's on the it's, same it's page. It's bookmark. I mean, you start out with Yeshua and you end with the Yeshua. Yeah. So here it says Yeshua who is called Mashiach. I mean, so, so the narrator is telling you he's the one who is called Mashiach. So to say that he's not called Mashiach in, in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, I mean, you can't get out of the first chapter without him being called Mashiach in the Hebrew. Exactly. Now, here's the interesting thing. You'd think, well, wait a minute. Why did they remove one from the Hebrew? Well, maybe they added one to the Greek. One of the things you learn the most basic idea in New Testament criticism is about how when the scribes would copy things, they had certain formulas. Mm -hmm. And then they had formulas they would use in, in daily speech. These were monks who copied the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And in daily speech, every time they said Jesus, they would say Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. And so you find in some of the later medieval manuscripts in the, in the, the um, earlier Greek texts, it'll just say Jesus, Jesus. But in some of the later ones, it'll say Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? This is basic yes. New Testament criticism 101, that there was a, an expansion of that title because when th these priests would talk to each other and they would say the name Jesus, they felt it was disrespectful not to say Christ, our Lord, mm -hmm. right? It was just considered a sign of respect. Just like Jews today, when they say Moshe or Orthodox Jews, when they ever say Moshe, that is Moses, they'll say Moshe Rabbeinu, mm -hmm. right? They won't just say Moshe. You can't have a conversation with Orthodox Jews our rabbi. and say Moshe. They'll say Moshe Rabbeinu, our rabbi. So imagine if, it, and this didn't happen as far as I know, but imagine if they're copying it, or I'll give you an example where it did happen. If they were copying it and they put in Rabbeinu, and they didn't happen in the Tanakh, but where it did happen is if you go back like, I don't know, 750 years, one of the common titles for God is HaKadosh, the Holy One. Mm -hmm. Now, in daily speech, what Jews would do is they would, whenever they said HaKadosh, they would say Baruch Hu, 
blessed be he, right? To the point where it's now a single, almost a single word, Hakadosh, you know, American Jews will say Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, as if it's one word, the Holy One, blessed be he. So what you have in medieval manuscripts, not of the Tanakh, of, um, of other works, is the original writer wrote Hakadosh. We can see that in the manuscripts. But later when it was printed, it became the Holy One, blessed be he. Right? Blessed be he was, in, was interpolated, it was inserted by the copyist. And that might be what happened here, right? In other words, two possibilities. One is the Hebrew omitted accidentally or on purpose the word Christ, Mashiach. Second possibility, the Greek expanded it either on purpose, like you said, because the Gentile reader might not have known who, you know, the significance of Ben David, or by accident, because it's just part of his daily speech. All right, the next one is Matthew 117, where the Greek has Christ. Well, that verse isn't in the Hebrew, so it doesn't tell us anything. Matthew 118 has Jesus Christ, and in the Hebrew it only has Yeshua, it does not have Mashiach, right? So if you're looking for places to pin it on Hebrew Matthew and say he took out the word Mashiach, that's a possibility, or maybe the Greek added it, right? Or maybe when, when Matthew wrote it in Hebrew, he didn't put it in because the Jews knew who we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And in the Greek, he did put it in because they needed more information in the Greek. Mm -hmm. Matthew 2.4 is Herod. It has it in both. Matthew 11.2 is really interesting, and we'll get to that. It's the narrator speaking. We're going to get to 11.2? Somebody say amen. By the grace of God, we will get to 11.2. <laughs> But if we don't, so there it's talking about uh, John was interested in what's happening, I'm paraphrasing, with Christ. And in the Hebrew, it doesn't say Christ, it says Yeshua. So there Yeshua is in place of Christ. And the other place that had Jesus Christ, Yeshua, mm. Christ was omitted, but Yeshua was still there. Here Yeshua is actually in place of Mashiach. Mm. That's interesting, Matthew eleven two, 2. Matthew 16, 16, he's talking to Peter, and there it has Christ or Mashiach in both the Hebrew and the Greek. Matthew 16, 20. Now, this is interesting. Can you read Matthew 16, 20? I know we want to get to Matthew 1, 1 through 16, but this one's important. In case we don't get to Matthew 16, by the grace of God, at least we'll have talked about every verse in the book of Matthew where Yeshua is called Mashiach in the Hebrew and in the Greek. Can I get an amen? Yes, sixteen twenty. Then yeah. he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christos, the Christ. Right. So, Nestle Allen 28, which is the most recent compilation of all the manuscripts that's considered authoritative by scholars or the most reliable by scholars has Christ. However, the Byzantine text has Jesus Christ, which is interesting that he would not tell them that uh, he was Jesus Christ. Well, everybody knows he's Jesus, right? <laughs> and the Hebrew has Mashiach. So here it's not that the Hebrew has Mashiach and the Greek has Jesus Christ. One version of the Greek has Christos. Another version has Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. So there's variation within the Greek as well. And of course, there is variation in some cases in the Hebrew. I mean, a uh, lot of people don't know, that, I think, what is it, approximately 5,000 different Greek manuscripts, New Testament, and many change differences. Right. This is what's called text criticism, trying to figure out what the original so This is what's called the Byzantine majority text. Basically, you had these guys and these monks in Byzantine monasteries in the, you know, let's say from the 10th to the 15th century, and they're copying the New Testament. And it's not always the most accurate copy. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's definitely, here's an example of an expansion, right? You're going to say Christ without Jesus? I mean, that doesn't make sense to them. So they add in Jesus there. Or the Hebrew and the earlier Greek removed it, right? I mean, again, it's... Is it fair to say, okay. at least for us, now again, this is Shavuot. We're bringing both a, a Jewish and Gentile perspective to the Hebrew yeah. Gospel of Matthew. And in that first verse, there's common ground there. The common ground for me when I'm first reading it, is they're explaining to me who this person is called Jesus. For you, when you see Son of David, you're back in Samuel, you're in Chronicles about the promise. I'm in Isaiah chapter 11, a shoot shall come forth from Jesse, Yeah, right? This yeah. is Ben David. But isn't it uh, interesting? Right yeah. away, right away in the first verse, instead of something where guys yelling at you saying, this is what you're trying to do, there is commonality right there, which actually uh, leads to a source to him. Yeah. I want to hold that because I want to go through every verse. We're almost done. I'll do this quickly. And I'll put up the, the PDF on the Matthew twenty two forty two. Yes, Yeshua is speaking, and he uses the word Christos in the Greek, Mashiach in the Hebrew. Twenty three eight is really interesting. In twenty three eight, in the standard Greek text, the, the word Christos doesn't appear, but it does appear in the Byzantine majority text. Mm -hmm. So, are you going to say that the Nestle Allen twenty eight text and the earliest manuscripts of Matthew are anti-Messiah because they take out Christ from Matthew 23.8? No, it's just a textual variant, right? Somebody was copying it, and somebody either made a mistake by omitting it or by adding it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and which one is a matter of interpretation? 
The Hebrew doesn't have Mashiach there either, but in 2310, both of them have Mashiach. Mm -hmm. And Yeshua is referring to the Messiah as an institution. I suppose it's alluded to that it's referring to him in those verses. He doesn't explicitly say, hey, I'm the one I'm talking about. But he says, you're supposed to obey the Mashiach in Matthew 2310, in both the Hebrew and the Greek. Right, So to say that it doesn't call him Mashiach in the Hebrew Matthew, that's just not true. That's very it's, helpful. You know, yeah. it's, it's just misunderstanding. All right, there's a bunch more, but I'm going to put those up on the PDF. You wanted to bring something else, on, and I'm going to toss the ball over to you. Oh, no. Well, actually, this is where it got very interesting to me. And when I started to go through the first chapter, I wanted to skip it. After I learned about the first things, Jesus Christ, and they started talking about these names and names that I could hardly pronounce and names that were in this list. And I'm like, what's the big deal? What's this genealogy thing? And uh... <laughs> can we be honest? Most people, I think when they read Genesis, they get to Genesis 10 with this just flood of names and they probably read the first name and the last name and they skip everything in between. Well, what I did is I started out, okay, first verse was important and I wanted to get down to the Christmas story. This is my, not my all I was like, listen for me, where's, where am I going to hear about the Kings and all of that? So for, again, for me, What's so amazing about this study that we're doing is yeah. that through the process of looking at the Greek and looking at the Hebrew, some amazing things, some really powerful things come out, which have been problems, at least for me and for many of my friends who've been reading this. And until I got to Hebrew Gospel from Matthew, some of this just couldn't be, how can I say, it just didn't fit. And so we, we've, we've dove into, we dove into that. So hopefully we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, genealogies and how those genealogies are related to something else that's going on. <laughs> So it's really interesting in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, if you take this really literally, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 contradicts verses 2 through 17. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? It says, these are the generations of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So is he the son of David? And, and we, first of all, forget, not forget, but leave Yeshua aside here for a moment. David's not the son of Abraham, right? <laughs> David is a descendant of Abraham not the son of Abraham. And then Yeshua is not the son of David. He, according to the description here and how exactly is kind of complicated, right? When we bring Luke into it, which we will later, but Yeshua is not the son of David. According to this, he's a descendant of David. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is I wanted to bring other sources, not just our opinions, but see what other people had to say about this as we were studying this. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled upon, I think, three really important sources. The first one that we're, I don't think we're gonna get to today because we won't have time, but there's a translation from the 19th century by C.D. Ginsburg. It's called the Salkinson's Ginsburg translation. And then a similar related translation is the uh, Dalich translation. Those are two translations from the Greek into Hebrew. And I think it can be very instructive to compare what we find in our Hebrew Matthew with what's in Ginsburg and Dalich's translation, because they tell us they're translating from Greek. And we also know they're translating for the purpose of converting Jews. So that's interesting. Here we have, you know, they have a, they tell you up front what their agenda is and why they translated it in a certain way overall. And then to see how that compares with what's in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew could be really interesting. I don't think we'll get to that today. Another source I asked you to look at, Keith, and, and we'll be referring to throughout this study, is a book called The Jewish Annotated New Testament. Mm -hmm. This was a book that was published a number of years ago in Jerusalem, or it was at least launched in Jerusalem. I was there for the launch. And it's Jewish scholars who are commenting on the New Testament. <laughs> and the question was raised, th this was in Jerusalem. I was there with you, Nehemiah. You were there with me? And, and, and the guy came in and he said, I want to understand why they didn't include me in the... Uh... Oh, you were there. I forgot about that. Do, do you, you know where that took place? What do you mean you forgot? I, I forgot that you were there. So do you know what that building was where we had, where that was launched? That was the Orthodox Union. Yeah. The Orthodox Union is an international organization. If you look on cream cheese, for example, in an American supermarket, it has a little U with an O around it. And that's the symbol of the Orthodox Union. That means there's a rabbi at the plant who made sure that that cream cheese was given the stamp of approval, that there's no pork milker in there or whatever, right? That's the OU, Orthodox Union. So the Orthodox Union had a session on... The Jewish Annotated New Testament, and one of the speakers there was Avigdor Shinan, a professor at Hebrew University, and he got up and he said, you know what, we're not doing this for the Christians, we're doing this for us. Because as Jews, this is a primary source for understanding Second Temple Judaism, out of which Judaism today evolved. And he brought the example of the Haftarah. We did an entire series called Prophet Pearls, where we went through the Haftarah portions, read every week in different synagogues, and 
this professor from Hebrew University gets up and he says, do you know the first reference we have in historical documents to the Haftarah is in the New Testament? Right. And that's in Luke when Yeshua gets up in the synagogue and he opens up and he reads from uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, that's the first reference we have to the Haftarah or the Haftorah. Right. So he says, this isn't for the Christians. You know, Christians can benefit from this, but this is for Jews to understand this document. Jews need to understand it in and of itself as a source of Jewish history. Amen. And tell us then, Keith, who else got up and, and who wasn't a speaker. Hey, listen, I want to get to this. I, I mean, listen. We can't <laughs> sure. Okay, we'll skip it. All right. Here's no. the, what's most important. It was the heckler who got up. I remember uh -huh. him saying this, and this was the, the feeling of what he was saying. He's saying, this is our book too, meaning our book. That's and, absolutely what he said. A text. Uh, and, and so that that's really powerful. Those are the two sources that we're looking at. Now, the third source yes. is one that I, I, I mean, when we talked about doing this, oh man, 2015, we talked about doing this, and I think the the Jewish annotated New Testament. I actually have one signed by the author or one of the authors, right? Because there's a bunch of authors. And let's see, what year did it come out? Oh, 2011. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So it was 2000. All right. So 2015, we discussed doing Hebrew Gospel pearls. I remember thinking that's a source that we should look at: the Jewish annotated New Testament. What we will do. We don't have to agree with it, but we should at least hear what they have to say. What I had no inkling of and had didn't even know about was a book written third the third source and this was a book called well it was a book originally called kol kore a voice crying out in the wilderness which is really interesting the voice crying out it's the phrase obviously from isaiah and it's quoted in the new testament you weren't going to have this source you got an email from someone and then i got an email and i want to read this email so this book kol kore was written by a rabbi in the 19th century i'd never heard of this book and I get this email, and so this was after we'd already discussed, we we're talking about possibly doing something on Matthew, and somebody wrote to me, his name is Yosef, and he says, heard you were going to discuss the Gospels. I found an interesting commentary from a rabbi in the 1800s who had a similar idea, and he was very much into creating a dialogue between the Christian and the Jew through comparative study of oral traditions, the Tanakh, and the things found in the New Testament. In his opinion, they were perfectly compatible rather than juxtaposed. Mm -hmm. You may be interested in his transcript. He writes, I'm an Orthodox Jew, and I found it a fascinating read. And he gives me the name of this book, <laughs> and he writes, anyway, I'm a proud support team member, and I uh, appreciate you, a seeker and lover of Torah. I hope you do a show on this rabbi. I actually learned something from him very unexpected. J just as a, as a segue there, this Orthodox Jew is, is mentioning in the email that he's a support team member. Support team members are people who support McCore Hebrew Foundation, which is my 501c3 that allows me to be sitting here after dozens of hours of preparation and study, putting out these teachings, uh, editing these videos, putting them out in the chemiswall.com. People who donate to uh, McCore Hebrew Foundation, they get access to teachings that I put out. Uh, most of the stuff I put out is just for everybody, but if you want kind of go deeper, that is the support team that I do. And this gentleman, this Orthodox Jew, is a member of the support team, which I think is pretty cool. Keith, don't you have something like that as well? i tell you what, I'm not going to talk about that because you're in the zone. Okay. Talk about All right. So he tells me about this book, and the English translation is the Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament. But the original name is Kol Kore, a voice calling out and then you can put in brackets, in the wilderness. And it's written by a rabbi named Elijah Tzvi Soloveitchik. <laughs> and I hear that name, and I'm like, Soloveitchik? I know that name. So I immediately go on Amazon, order the book. It arrived a few days ago, and I call you up with my mouth dropped. Before you say what you, what you called me about. Yeah. This is a, can I say, um, from a source that you would not expect, to be talking about, in fact, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. that he was the first or one of the first? He is the first Jew ever to write a commentary on the New Testament. So, so stop, just for a second, guys. Now, just, I want everyone at Shavuot, okay? Yeah. We're here doing the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. We've got our sources. We read our meeting together. Don't know how forgot about the meeting. We were in Jerusalem. We've got Dalich. We've got the Hebrew Gospel. We got the 28 manuscripts. And then, just recently, the third source comes from a man who is writing about the connection between the Bible, the Tanakh, the Talmud, and mm -hmm. the New Testament. And yeah. somebody say, <laughs> things stopped. <laughs> Everything stopped, and, and no, so it's incredible here. So in the introduction, they're explaining, these uh, scholars are explaining, he's the first Jew to write a commentary on the New Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and they explain, there are Jews who wrote about the New Testament before that, but they were Jews who were in debates, 
And as part of the debates, they were saying, we could use this argument, we could use that argument. They weren't trying to understand the New Testament in and of itself. They were criticizing the New Testament. And here's a rabbi who comes along and he's actually saying, no, I want to understand what this book means. Yes. So this rabbi, Eliyahu Tzvi Soloveitchik, he was born in 1805 and died in 1881 mm -hmm. at the age of around 75 or 76. And I opened this up and I was confirmed in the first few pages is what I suspected because I know the name Soloveitchik. Soloveitchik, that's a family of famous rabbis who are cousins of my family. And I wasn't sure, is this the same Soloveitchik? I open up the book and I see, yes, this man is my cousin. <laughs> You called me and you said, Keith, everything changes. <laughs> so he's my cousin. And in fact, I can tell you exactly how he's my cousin. So there's a website, genie.com. And I go there and my genealogy, I put that in there a few years ago. I, I, I found like death certificates and birth certificates and all kinds of documents from and tax records from Russia. And so I was able to trace my lineage in there. And it's interesting. We're talking about tracing lineage. One of the questions that was asked, I was discussing with T-Bone, this whole section of Matthew 1, 1 through 17, and he asked a question I didn't think about much. He said, where'd they get this information? Where did they get? You know, fine, up until Salathi, Sal I can't say the word, Shaltiel, Salathiel, if I'm not pronouncing that correct in English, up until Salathiel, those are all names that appear in the Tanakh, yeah. right? Matthew is not telling us any name we can't find in the Tanakh up until Salathiel. The names that appear after that don't appear anywhere in the Tanakh. They don't appear in any other Jewish sources. They don't appear in the Talmud. Where did Matthew get them? And here we are. And I thought, okay, well, a few years ago I went and I dug through tax records and I found birth certificates and death certificates. And I found the community ledger written by the rabbi in 1846 from my great, great, uh, um, let's see, he's my uh, uh, second great grandfather, Rabbi Baruch Nassan al so these documents will, ex I mean, imagine this, we're in 2020 and the document still exists after the Holocaust and the burning of Eastern Europe, the document from 1846 still exists with the handwriting of the rabbi. And I was able to order a photograph of it from the National Archives of Lithuania. So what we're doing today, they could have done in, in, you know, in the time of Yeshua, meaning documents existed at the time. So as we're asking the question on the genie, we're still in Matthew chapter one, folks. Believe us, we're still in Matthew chapter one. I think we're still on verse one. So the three sources we're going to use as we go through this study, Dalich, the annotated Jewish New Testament, and then this particular book by Nehemiah's <laughs> cousin. <laughs> and so specifically, he's my second cousin five times removed. Five times removed. So I was able to look up on genie.com and it shows you how, because I don't know how to calculate those times removed and stuff can like I, that. Can I read he's my second cousin. <laughs> Can I, can, please everyone, if, if you would just understand the significance of this and why it was so significant to me, specifically for Shabbat, I did something to him a, a few days ago once. I actually ordered the book too. We both read the beginning of the book. I didn't even get to the issue, the commentary of it, the one, one through 16, a, a step 16. But he says some things that really caught both of our attentions. And you called me with one of them. Can you read that? I mean, it's... B before we get to that, I, I want to I just explain to people how radical this was I think he wrote this around 1878, or he published a first draft around 1878, how radical this was for an ultra-Orthodox, I'm a Karite Jew, for many Jews I'm a heretic to begin with, for an ultra-Orthodox Jew to write a commentary on the New Testament, and it's not a criticism of how horrible the New Testament is, it's saying, what is the New Testament trying to say? Honestly, what he did in some ways is more radical than what I'm doing. And by the way, the fourth most obvious source we have, which is zero, right? It's, it's like before the first, second, and third source is the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew itself with the manuscripts, right? Yeah. But this, so you call this the fourth source. So what he did was so radical because he was an ultra-Orthodox Jew. He was not a Jewish convert to Christianity. There were Jews who converted to Christianity who wrote commentaries. Mm -hmm. He's the first Jew who remained a Jew, and in fact, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, of writing a commentary. And let me read you something that he said, which just blew me away. Yeah. Before I get to that, just to give an idea of who this Soloveitchik is, the founder of modern Orthodox Judaism in America is a rabbi named Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik. American Orthodox Jews refer to him as the Rav, which means the rabbi, right? If you say the Rav and you don't say who you're talking about in American Judaism, you mean the great, great, great nephew, I don't know how many greats, of the man who wrote this commentary on the New Testament, right? Eliyahu Eliya Tzvit Soloveitchik was the brother of the ancestor of the Rav. I mean, that's, whoa, that's a big deal in itself. The brother of the Rav lived around the, the corner from where I grew up and 
I used my father used to take me over to his house on Shabbat. And my father's best friend was the nephew of the Rav, the son of the man that we used to visit. And the synagogue we used to go to, that I used to go to growing up, was Moshe Soloveitchik's shul. It was the synagogue where the rabbi was the essentially like a great, 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 great nephew of this rabbi who wrote the commentary on the New Testament. Now, in the introduction to the book, anybody can buy this on Amazon. It's called The Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament. In the introduction, the scholar who translates it, he explains that another scholar went and asked a family member, right? Because it's a very prominent family. And they asked him about different members of the family. Oh, we have a family story about Rav Chaim Brisker. We have a family story about Rav Yosef Dov. We have a family about the Beis Halevi, right? They have, fa- they have stories that go on generation after generation about these different famous rabbis. And then they ask him about Rav Eliyahu Tzvi Salavechik, who wrote the commentary on the New Testament. And what's the, what were they told? We don't talk about him. <laughs> so I want to read to you what Rabbi Eliyahu Tzvi, Elijah Tzvi Salavechik, writes in the introduction to his... Keith, if we do nothing else, if we don't even touch a single Hebrew Matthew manuscript, if we do nothing else but go through and discuss the comments of Rabbi Eliyahu Tzvi Salavechik, I think this will be an extremely important series, something that's never been done. A Jew and a Christian are coming together to discuss what the first... Jewish commentary on the New Testament talked about. Do you know why I didn't know about this book, uh, Keith? I guess you could say I I was ignorant of it, right? I've said there's libraries full of books I don't know about. But in fact, this book only came out in 2019. It was published originally like around 1878, 1879. As far as I know, there's one copy in Hebrew at the National Library of Israel, which I haven't seen yet. I'm trying to get a hold of it, but the library's closed. Hopefully it'll open up very soon and and I'll get a, a scan of that. And the only thing that survived other than that, and there might be one copy in, in Paris as well, is the French translation. So it wasn't translated into English, and it still isn't available in Hebrew, as far as I can tell. At least not anywhere. I, you know, there's a, there's a website called HebrewBooks.org. They purport to have every book written by rabbis, or they're trying to have every book written by rabbis uh, that was ever printed. Not manuscripts, but printed books. And this book, surprisingly, is not there. So it wasn't until last year that the English translation was available, and the Hebrew original is still not available to me, at least. Hopefully it will be soon. All right, so this is what Rabbi Eliyahu Tzvi Salavechik wrote in 1879 in the introduction to the first Hebrew edition. And I have to say, I got a little bit emotional when I read this. This is my second cousin, five times removed, writing the first Jewish commentary from a Jew who didn't convert to Christianity on the New Testament. He says, I know that I will not escape from the criticism of both sides, Jews and Christians. My Hebrew brethren will say, what happened to Rev Eliyahu? Yesterday he was one of us, and today he was filled with a new spirit. New said sarcastically. And my Christian brethren will say, this one who is a Jew comes to reveal to us the secrets of the Gospels? How can we accept that he speaks correctly? and a true spirit dwells within him. He says these two extremes are really saying one thing, that it is, it cannot be that what he is speaking with his mouth is what he believes in his heart. On this criticism, my soul weeps uncontrollably. Only God knows, and God is my witness, that in this I am free of sin. Keith, these are words that I've prayed in my heart on many occasions. Because I have the Christians out there, some of the, the Hebrew roots folks who say, Nehemiah is a secret missionary. His goal is to convert us to Judaism. And I have the Christians out there, some of them, Hebrew roots people as well. Nehemiah is the Antichrist Jew. I mean, my second cousin, I guess it runs in the family. And, and the fact that today they talk about all the rabbis in their lineage, but they don't talk about him. He's the one, he's, you know, he's the, uh, the black sheep of the family. Can I also read something from this book that was inspiring to me? Yes. Uh, at the end of his introduction, he reads this. He says this. He's actually talking about how he's being attacked from both sides. Yeah. He says, may I succeed in this venture? May the favor of yud Hey vav Hey, he puts the Y-H-W-H, descend upon my work so that it may produce in the hearts of those who read it abundant and beneficial fruits, that with a unanimous spirit they will embrace the worship of one God, and that through my humble intervention, the words of the prophet, and I love the verse because you and I talked about it many times as we traveled the world, that the words of the prophet will come true, Zephaniah 3.9. Mm. Then I will make the peoples pure of speech yes. so that they all will invoke yud vav by name and serve him with one accord 
wow. or shoulder to shoulder or one shoulder. Wow. And Jimmy, when I read this, I did something really radical. Yeah. I made a phone call. Mm -hmm. I got on the phone and I called the grandson of Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Yeah. Rabbi wow. Eliezer Ben Yehuda, the grandson of the man who actually, <laughs> when we read that verse in Zephaniah 3 9 about a pure, pure language, you can do your research on Eliezer Ben Yehuda, his grandson. I called him, Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yehuda, and I told him, I said, listen, have you ever heard of this book? He says, I've heard of this person, but I haven't heard of the book. I said, can I send it to you? He said, yes, you can send it to me. And as I was talking to him, he said something to Hemi that I want to share in the spirit of Shavuot, because he is also a man who has bridged, <laughs> done much in terms of reaching beyond his own place of belief, but staying where he believes. He's not a messianic. He is a, an Orthodox rabbi in the lineage of Eliezer ben Yehuda. I mean, this is no small thing. Yeah, so Eliezer ben Yehuda, for those who don't know, was the, the um, Jewish scholar who around 1880 moved to, in 1880 moved to Israel and began the process of reviving Hebrew as a spoken language. Up until then, it had been a literary language. It had even been revived as a secular literary language, yes. but he revived it as a daily spoken language. So Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yehuda, actually, he came to Charlotte. We did a conference together called Return to the Book. It's available, BFA International. But I want to show you what he said. He said, Nehemiah, one of the things that I live by is a quote from uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling, a poem published in 1889. It says this, O east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there is neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Wow. And when I thought about that, I thought about you, I thought about me, I thought about the many people that still are saying there's got to be some common ground. And I think we found it in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. I really do believe that coming face to face, we can go into this text and we can study it in, in depth. And so you talked about the sources, you talked about the first verse, can we at least do something just as a compromise? Because you keep talking about running out of time. But Nehemiah, there is a game-changing pearl verse mm -hmm. in 116 that you must share with the people. And then I'm going to do something to, to bolster it. Here's what I'd like to do. Here's what I'd like to offer. I'd like to offer a Hebrew-English interlinear of 1 through 16, made available, bfainternational.com, go to the front page. There'll be a PDF there. If you want the study Nehemiah just talked about, go to um, um, Nehemiah'sWall.com and you're going to get the PDF. You're going to get an interlinear Hebrew-English using the tool that we have, vowel pointed of all the words with English. But this last verse, Nehemiah, I'm not letting you off until you talk about. Oh, no, Keith, there, I don't want to bring it yet. There's so much more I want to talk about that is, I think, even more radical than what we have in verse 16. There's a lot of stuff here. I don't think it's fair to the people to just jump to verse 16. So what, how, are you saying you're going to agree to continue to, to do the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew? I mean, say it right now. Well, no, I, I think we'll continue right now. If you have the energy and the strength, do, do you have it? I think we're going to have to go into the into the after game, you know, into what do they call so that? You're saying, like you're, the saying, extra you're, saying, you're saying we're going to go ahead and continue to the best of our ability with the yeah. sources we have. Can I name them again for everybody? Sure. Dalich. I have a copy there. Dalich slash uh, Ginsburg. Those are two different Hebrew translations okay, from the Ginsburg. Greek. Okay, the, the, the annotated Jewish New Testament. New Testament. The Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament by your cousin. Mm -hmm. And the 28 manuscripts of the yes. Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Those are going to be our sources. We're launching yeah. on Shavuot in the spirit of your cousin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. this is a big deal. No, th this is a big deal. Uh, yeah. Keith, I, I think we're going to have to do like an at, like where you add innings. So can we do... A Hebrew Gospels plus for people. Can we do it now? You know what? This is a good. You know, okay, now look. This is happening as we're speaking, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is happening right now. So, so look. So you're saying that if anyone really wants to get further into the actual verses, we can have a, a Hebrew Gospel plus. Now, this is something that's done out in the world where you. Well, I mean, this, this is a very common model out there that you know, like people will will do like a podcast. It'll be an hour, and they say, "Hey, if you want more, come over and subscribe." And in this case, you know, we're we're, we're not talking about subscribing; we're talking about supporting the ministries. We've talked about to you know, we've talked about how we need your support. And so, for those who support NehemiahsWall.com and BFAInternational.com, I think we should do the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. So, in other words, and, we talk, we we we, we yeah. get into the nitty gritty. So, because because I guess you know, in, in one sense, what you're saying is a person's got to be pretty serious if they really want to get into this. You got and look, this might be enough for some people, right? We've just spoken for an hour, and I, and there's one more thing before we get into the plus section. If you agree to do that, 
that I want to share with everybody. And the, and because we're launching this on Shavuot, yeah. And the connection here to Shavuot is is people don't realize how powerful the connection is. You talked so, about uh, my life in 2002. I came. I said I met you as well. Shavuot. I won't bore the people. Go ahead, tell them. Tell them. So look, I mentioned before Genesis chapter 10 how there's this just flood of names and people like no pun intended because right after the flood, right? But you read these names and you're like, what is? Why do we have all these names? And it says, and from there they separate out the to the languages of the nations. So. If you count those names, there are 70 names. I mean, look, we're dealing here with a bunch of names, and you count the names in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17 or 16, and you find out, wow, there's actually a, a, um, a plan here to the names, especially in, in the Greek version. We see the, the 14, 14, 14, and when we get to verse 16, we'll share some really powerful stuff. That'll have to be in the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus at this rate. So when you count the names in Genesis 10, you get 70 names. And then in Deuteronomy 32, in the Song of Moses, he says he divided up the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. In the Septuagint, they didn't understand what that meant. And so they translated it according to the number of the angels of God. Mm -hmm. And there's a Dead Sea Scroll that seems to reflect that understanding as well. But what is the number of the children of Israel? How many Israelites came down from Egypt? 70. So there's 70 nations in Genesis 10, and 70 Israelites are counted coming down to Egypt. So he divided up the nations into languages based on the 70 number of the children. In other words, what Deuteronomy 32 is telling us is that that this number 70 is important, mm -hmm. that there's 70 um, nations and 70 children of Israel who came down to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And he's tying the two in. And what he's telling you is, when I give you a bunch of names, it's not some trivial, unimportant information. You might not immediately understand the significance of the information, but it's important. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into some of the importance in Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus in a few minutes. And Keith, so I think what we're going to have to do so it's going to be available to the support team and the BFA International. What do you call your... Uh, uh... I guess the best... And folks, you're with us in the moment. The, the best way to do this, I think, so that there's support of both ministries, we have a premium content library. It's $9.99 a month. And what that allows you to have is access to everything, biblical Hebrew course, everything that we do. And I think if we have people that are premium content library members and support team members of, BF, uh, uh, of Nehemiah's Wall, that if that's where we have the plus at, that would give them a chance to do yeah. what we have actually been calling people to do, which is to support both ministries. And why is that important? One, it's the spirit of Jew and Gentile coming together. But two, the truth is this does take time, energy, and resource. And I think, Nehemiah, we have certainly at NehemiahsWall.com, you have, and we at BFAInternational.com have more than enough things that are free. Free, say free, free, oh, yeah. free, free, free. The Red Letter Series, free, 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 free. All the things, profit pros, free, free, free. What this would allow us to do is to get a group of people that are ready to go deeper, can I say this, in yeah. joint study with us. So that in other yeah. words, uh, uh, Hebrew Gospel Pros Plus would give you some homework, would give you some extra resources, would give you some, some things that you can dive in with us as we go deeper into the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. So, it, so it look, the sense. first one, I, I think, I, so here's my idea here. What do you think? So I think what we should do is, I mean, we're kind of coming up with some of this in the moment, is we'll alternate. One week they've got to go over to bfainternational.com and become a member over there. And the next week they come over to uh, uh, nehemiahswall.com and support McCor Hebrew Foundation. Okay. And if anybody wants to get all 115, or I mean, I hope that there'll be 115, <laughs> then they'll have to support both ministries is what we talked about. So the first one is going to be over on bfainternational.com. Go over there, join the premium content library, and you'll get the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Guess what you're going to get when you do that? Yeah. When you go there, you're going to have you're going to have Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. You're going to have a translation of one through seventeen, the, the Hebrew English uh, transliteration, along with uh, the, the the tool that you've given us. Oh, you've got a transliteration. Yeah, transliteration okay. and trans uh, interlinear. I'm sorry, interlinear. Sorry, interlinear. Oh, okay, interlinear. it's going to be interlinear. But what we'll do, and you know, we can add even more. But here's the exciting thing about this: so we cast lots, and then, let me tell you what you did, folks. I want to tell you what Nehemiah did. This was his idea, and he said, Keith, to show you that the idea works, I'd like your ministry to be first. Not supposed to be the Jew first, then the Gentile. But he said, no, I'm supposed to have you do it first so that if it doesn't work, it's on you. <laughs> well, and it might not work, and we might decide after two weeks, hey, we're going to limit it to 30 minutes every week, and, and whatever we get to, we get to, right? So, I mean, so what we'll do is we're going we're gonna to switch into uh, Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. That's going to be available. Your premium member, it's very, 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 very inexpensive. 
you can be there and you can have access then from that point on as a premium content library member. And the next week will be at, tell them again, nehemiaswall.com. And what's going to happen there? They're going to become support team. Support team members. You, uh, you know, support Nehemiah's uh, core Hebrew foundation. That's the 501c3. And you get added as this automatically as a support team member. And, uh, and you'll get half of these are going to be at BFA yeah. and half of these are going to be at Nehemiah's wall, as many as that we do. And that that will be the case so that we, we're going to both places. Well, and maybe we'll only do one. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> For those who don't know, there's 115 sections of the Gospel of Matthew. In other words, we have 28 chapters in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's broken into 115 sections. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we had was we'll do the 115 one per episode. I don't know that we expected to talk an hour on verse one, <laughs> but of chapter one. Well, this was this was the Shavuot celebration. And That's so true. So, so just in the spirit of Shavuot, yeah. we talked about Genesis chapter 10 has 70 nations. Both in uh, later in Genesis, I think it's 46, then Exodus, we have 70 Israelites coming down to uh, Egypt. So 70 nations, 70 Israelites. Deuteronomy 32 tries them, ties them together. He divided up the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. Now that's biblical text, right? You read Genesis 32, you need to have remembered and counted, paid attention enough to count, that there were 70 nations in Genesis 10. And it's not just in Genesis 10. That was the ancient concept that there were 70 nations in the world. Genesis 10 just tells us what those 70 nations are in the known world at that time. And you have 70 uh, Israelites that came down to Egypt. Now, you have those two numbers. They're tied together in Genesis 32, or in Deuteronomy 32 in the Song of Moses. That's all biblical Tanakh stuff. In Jewish tradition, there's a discussion about the Ten Commandments. Now, I have a teaching called Shavuot, Feast of Oaths. Uh, over on nehemiaswall.com in the, in the, as one of the support team studies. And what I show there is that Shavuot is the only feast day for which a date is not given. Mm -hmm. We know it's in the third month, 50 days after the uh, beginning of the counting of the Omer, but the range of dates can be anywhere from the fourth of the third month, of the third Hebrew month, to the 15th of the third Hebrew month. That's quite a range. And the date is intentionally not given because it's based on the Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread during what we call colloquially Passover. Now, Shavuot is in the beginning of the third Hebrew month. Every one of the feasts has a historical event assigned to it as well as an agricultural event. So the agricultural event of Passover is the barley harvest, the beginning of the barley harvest. The one for Sukkot, the third feast, is the ingathering of the crops from the field and from the, the, the processing of the crops from the field. And for Shavuot, it's the wheat harvest. So we've got barley, wheat, and fully processing the grains. Those are the three feasts. The historical events is obvious for a Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? It's that they had unleavened bread when they left Egypt because they were in a hurry. For Sukkot, it is they dwelt in booths. What about Shavuot? So the historical event tied to Shavuot is never explicitly stated, but it is from the earliest Jewish sources, we are told that it is the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. When did that take place? If you read, it's very clear in Exodus, it took place in the beginning of the third Hebrew month. What date? We're not told. We're told about the third Hebrew month, and then we count three days. But we don't even know what really date in the third Hebrew month. So sometime early in the third Hebrew month is when God revealed his word on Mount Sinai. Apparently at Shavuot, or Shavuot then is understood to remember that. At very least, you can't dispute that the two coincide as being early in the third Hebrew month without a definitive date. And it might be that that's why we don't have a definitive date for the revelation at Sinai, because it would be tied to Shavuot, which doesn't have a definitive date. Well, if you're going to do that, you're going to, you're making that, that available on Shavuot, whatever, Countdown to Reconnection, which also talks yeah. about that, that launches the Ten Commandments series. For oh, rights. So Shavuot today, we'll make, I'll make it available. We'll, we'll yeah. do that, Nehemiah. Let me ask a question. Wait, wait, I didn't get to, I didn't get to the best part. Oh, I, I know this is giving me the best no, 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 this is all introduction. Oh. And then we'll end with this for the Hebrew Gospel Pearls, and then we'll launch immediately for those who want to continue into Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus over on BFAinternational.com. So here's the important part, right? All that's important, right? But here, here's the tie-in. So Jewish tradition said, you know, a mixed multitude left Egypt. When they heard God speak at Mount Sinai, what if they didn't speak Hebrew? Right, the whole thing is the entire congregation of Israel, not just the children of Israel. The entire congregation of Israel heard God with their own ears. So the tr Jewish tradition extrapolates and they say, well, if you were a Canaanite and you heard the Ten Commandments, you must have heard it in your own language. Amen. And if you were a Philistine, one of the mixed multitudes who left Egypt, and you heard the Ten Commandments, you must have heard it in the Philistine language. And if you were a Libyan, 
and you heard the Ten Commandments, you must have heard it in your own language. And if you were a Kushite, a Nubian, and you heard the Ten Commandments, you must have heard it in your own language. So what essentially Jewish tradition is doing is extrapolating based on the idea that we're told the whole congregation of Israel heard it. And how could it be that God spoke in Hebrew, but the Nubian heard it in his language? Because it's God speaking, he can do miracles. Yeah. So the tradition says that God spoke it, these words, and they were heard in 70 different languages. Now, Acts chapter 2 Here's describes the an event in the history of the church, in the history of the Yeshua movement, where the people come together on what Jewish festival? Shavuot. Shavuot. And what happens? People start speaking in different languages. And these weren't gibberish languages. These were languages that people understood. And why were they, were they doing that? Because they were Jewish people from the diaspora who came from Rome, who didn't understand Hebrew. They were Jewish people from the diaspora who came from Tarsus, who maybe didn't understand Hebrew. They were Jewish people from the diaspora who came from Yemen, who maybe didn't understand Hebrew. This was the Feast of Weeks. People came from all over the Jewish diaspora. And instead of just speaking in Hebrew or possibly Aramaic, they were able to somehow, according to the book of Acts, right, they had the Pentecostal <laughs> event or experience speaking in tongues, which at that time meant speaking in the language which each person could understand, just like at Mount Sinai. So whether you believe that ha has happened or not, the Yosef, the Orthodox Jew in, who wrote to me, he maybe he doesn't believe that happened. That's okay. My question isn't what happened in the first century in this case. My question is, what is the book of Acts trying to communicate? And I have no doubt in my mind that the book of Acts is trying to communicate that this was a Mount Sinai type event, that just as God revealed the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, now a message was being revealed that would be understood by all the nations of the world. <laughs> so here we are on Shavuot. In their own language. <laughs> I don't know why. I, listen, let me, first of all, you're rushing us off here in the family. People are celebrating. They're sitting here with us. I want to thank you for spending the time that we're spending doing this. And I also want to thank you for, I think, inspiration. You're giving us inspiration on this information back to Genesis 10, 10 uh, to Exodus and Deuteronomy, all the way and through and to Acts. And here you've done it again. We're combining these two things to try to find commonality. And you've just found commonality um, through what you just talked about. But I want to say something. And, and this hit me. And I, I want to know if I can speak freely Please. here for a moment. I've really been touched by studying the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, and I've been studying. I've been touched by it because it's giving me a sense of a deeper connection. And, and I really want to encourage people: if you're serious about having a, a Bible study adventure, this uh, Hebrew Gospel Plus. Uh, you saw that Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Is that what you call it? Yeah. Hebrew Gospel just came Pearls up with that. <laughs> yeah, not, I love and I love that Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus is going to allow people who want to go deeper. And and again, that may not be for everybody. Yeah. But for me, it's changed my life. And I want to tell you, Nehemiah, it's 18 years as of today that I met you in 2002 at the time of Shavuot when I was called there. And the process that we've been in has brought us to this place. And I just believe that uh, this, is a, this is an invitation for people that are serious about wanting to understand more language, history, and context of the, of the Gospel of Matthew in its uh, Hebrew form. <laughs> Amen. Do you want to say some final words before we uh, end? I think we should pray for everyone. Pray for this process yeah. together if we can. And then uh, I'm going to invite people to be at uh, uh, episode one, Hebrew Gospel Pros Plus at bfainternational.com. And next week, we're going to be at uh, nehemiaswall.com for episode two. And we're going to try to go back and forth. And hopefully yeah. you all will, will uh, join in with us. Let's pray. Yehovah, thank you for bringing us together to discuss this document and, and its connections to your Tanakh, to your holy word. Mm -hmm. We're looking in the, here in, in Matthew, it brings us back to things in the Tanakh that we can then maybe understand in new ways we didn't understand. Yehovah, give us wisdom. Uncover our eyes that we may see the wonderful hidden things in your Torah and your prophets and your writings. And also in this gospel of Matthew in Hebrew and in Greek, give us wisdom to understand. And Yehovah, just as you spoke to Israel, your actual words they heard in, on Shavuot, that first Shavuot, mm -hmm. Yehovah continued to speak to people in every language, in every way that they could understand in their hearts and come before you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for uh, uh, a lineage that Nehemiah has uh, uncovered as we discuss the genealogies and all of this, Father. It's just not a coincidence to me uh, that he's found uh, 
great cousin, great, great, great cousin, <laughs> Elijah's beast, Lord, I can't even say it, but it is exciting, Father. And I want to thank you for the work, uh, the family, the heritage. I want to thank you also for what we're studying as we find uh, this genealogy and, and what's so much that comes out of it regarding uh, the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew and the first chapter. I want to thank you for both ministries. I pray that you'd give us wisdom, discernment, help it to be a smooth process for people, help people to just get on board with with uh, what we're trying to do in, in supporting one another and being able to come together in common ground, um, lifting up your name. And thank you so much for this, this study that we now have before us. We ask the blessing and protection over it in your name. Amen. Amen. You have been listening to Hebrew Gospel Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For a more in-depth study, check out Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus at NehemiasWall.com and BFAInternational.com. Thank you for your support. <laughs>